Hey there, I'm Al Horner, and you're listening to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. Each episode, an acclaimed screenwriter breaks down their first draft of what became a beloved film or series. This week on the show, I'm delighted to be joined by the wonderful Julia Cho, co-writer of one of 2022's best movies, an animated tale exploding with pandemonium. Emphasis there on panda. Pixar's Turning Red followed a 13-year-old Chinese-Canadian girl called Mei, who transforms into a giant red panda whenever she experiences strong emotion. What at first seems like a curse quickly becomes an opportunity for Mei and her friends, who are able to secretly raise money for tickets to see their favourite boy band, Four Town, live in concert. That is, of course, if the teenager can find a way to deal with her loving but extremely overprotective mother. Being a Pixar movie, it kind of goes without saying that Turning Red is packed with laughter, heart, emotion, spectacle, and of course sublime animation. But Turning Red broke new ground too, not just for Pixar, but for Hollywood at large. It took a subject matter that, let's face it, is rarely addressed in mainstream movies, female puberty, and approached it with a cultural specificity that was utterly joyous to watch. I had the pleasure of chatting with Julia about how all of this came together on the page. We talk about her own history with Pixar's work. Did you know that her and her husband had their first date at a screening of Monsters, Inc? How cool is that? We also talk about why the creative decision was taken to set the film against an early noughties backdrop, and why Julia and director Demi Shi, who also co-wrote the film, refused to hide behind metaphor when it came to talking about periods in the movie. Obviously, this is a very spoiler-filled conversation, covering every plot point all the way up to its apparently very difficult to conceive ending. So if you're yet to see Turning Red, it's probably best to do so before listening on. I had an absolute blast recording this one. Julia is such a fun and insightful guest. There were a few issues with her microphone, but honestly, she is so full of pearls of wisdom about screenwriting and, well, life in general, that hopefully they won't prove too distracting. Before we jump in, a quick reminder that Script Apart is now on Patreon. Yes, for the price of a single monthly cup of coffee, you can now help the show continue to grow and get early access to ad-free episodes. A huge thank you to everyone who's already part of that community. That includes Hank Harris and Tracy Witt. If you're not already a supporter and would like to get involved, you can sign up today at patreon.com forward slash script apart. We really appreciate your support. Anyways, that's enough out of me. Let's get into it, shall we? This is the awesome Julia Cho discussing the first draft secrets of Turning Red. Thanks as ever for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey, Julia, welcome to Script Apart. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I love this film so much, Julia. Let me get my facts straight on how you became involved in the project. I know, of course, you were a playwright prior to moving into film and TV. I also know that Demi originally pitched the idea in late 2017, I think it was. At what point were you brought in to help bring the story to life? And and what sort of state was the script in at that point? Yeah, so I came aboard uh, after Domi had already been developing her idea for, I think, about seven months, I would say, which in Pixar terms is like a a pittance of time, you know, (laughs) but she came in and she worked extremely fast and she actually had another writer before me. Uh, Her name is Sarah Stryker, great writer, and she and Domi worked together on um, developing uh, that idea that Domi came in with and pitched. Uh, and getting it through sort of, I think, an outline form. Um, you know, the way Pixar is, as I'm sure you've heard from other writers, is that there are all these kind of gates you have to pass through before they actually give you the keys to the car. <laughs> like, you have to prove you know how to, you know, parallel park and drive. So I think there was an outline, and then they were approved to a first draft. Um, and then Sarah had to leave because she had a project of her own going. So it was a very, like, you know, go with God. And it was a really amicable parting. Um, but then Domi was left needing a writer. And I'd already been there working on another project and had gotten to know her a tiny bit. Um, and so I think when the time came for her to need another writer, uh, I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but I, I think since she knew me and I'd already been at Pixar, um, it was just a very easy match. And so when I came in, um, I was told, I, w- I actually knew very little <laughs> coming into the project. They're very secretive at Pixar. So I knew its, it's code name was Red. And so um, I came in a little nervous because I wasn't sure what I was getting myself into. Um, But they had a first draft, like an early draft. um, And what they needed was a rewrite or they needed another draft, basically, that would actually get through the gate of going to production. 
Like from what I w- gathered, um, they had that first draft, a ton of notes, a ton of thoughts. Uh, and then I was coming in to write a draft that would hopefully get us then greenlit and approved for going into production, which is not CG, uh, you know, it's, but it's storyboards and the whole process of starting to cast it and edit it. So it's kind of like a big, uh, a big deal. So when I came in, I just remember uh, with trepidation looking at that first uh, early version of the movie and wondering what I would find. And to my great relief, I really loved it. It was that voice of May uh, was there. She was uh, a fully formed, adorable, dorky character, um, and which was, you know, amazing because then in some ways, knowing the character, we just had this incredible compass right from the very beginning. But then all the things around that character <laughs> were sort of <laughs> up for grabs and up for development. And so there was a lot of um, wrestling with this story, um, trying to get it into the best uh, scripted form we possibly could. Um, and then I just remember that was my my first big uh, kind of trial by fire, just like, here it is and go and write. And I, and I did, I, I went and wrote that first draft and we turned it in and, and we got greenlit. From the outside, it's easy to see what, uh, you know, what it was about what um, Demi wanted to explore with Turning Red that must have kind of chimed with you and some of your preoccupations as a storyteller. Like, so uh, your play Aubergine, that very much kind of uh, involved a child parent relationship. You also grew up the child of Korean parents in America, and yeah. uh, you've described yourself as identifying as American in a way that perhaps your parents didn't because you were born there. They, they, they hadn't been. What were some of the other ways in which immediately you started to see the space for you to bring some of your own experience to the screenplay? Well, definitely there was that whole experience of growing up, yeah, as a minority, but also just awkward and having parents from another country. Um, but I think that more than just the Asian-ness of it, I just associated or really resonated with the dorkiness <laughs> and the awkwardness <laughs> of the character and just the fact that she was this little overachiever, you know, and she had her friends, but she just had such humble wants, which I, I didn't have any really huge wants when I was 13. It's not like I wanted to save the world. I just wanted to go to the movies, you know, <laughs> or just have a little bit of freedom, you know? Um, so I think there was that, that really, um, appeal to me and just the irreverence of it because um, I wasn't that irreverent when I was a kid I was actually pretty uh, you know pretty rule following but I just love the voice that was felt just so fresh it was like the voice I I wished I'd had when I was 13 Um, that just kind of fearlessness and so I think there was some wish fulfillment in it too just like oh I want to see a character like this I want to see a voice like this So there was a lot to it. Um, And then, you know, and then I think just the fact that um, I really felt like when Domi and I talked about our experiences, that even though she was in Canada, I was in America, that so much of it was similar, that there was a lot of um, conversation that we could just talk about the story, talk about the characters that we didn't have to, to, we didn't even have to talk about the foundation of a lot of it because it was already shared. And I think that really helped and just helping us move faster and quicker because we could get to the heart of things uh, sooner. And I know you mentioned that you were already working at Pixar at this point, but kind of prior to this and prior to coming on board at Pixar, what was it that you admired about the studio? Were there particular storytelling traits within the studio and its body of work that um, had made you kind of want to, to kind of get involved there? Yeah, I definitely had my Pixar movies that I loved back when I was watching them just as a fan. I never, never in my wildest (laughs) imaginations that I think I would actually work at Pixar. So um, I do have clear memories, especially I think of, uh, I think I had, I think I I went on a date with my uh, now husband back when we were just dating. I think we went to go see Monsters Inc. together. And so that just goes to say something (laughs) that here we are both adults. (laughs) And, And that's the movie that we were both like, yeah, let's see that, you know. And we watched Monsters, Inc. together. And I just remember walking out of there with such joy because that movie is, is, it's so much fun, right? There's like that crazy door scene at the end where things are zipping by you. And it's just a spectacle and also just so heartfelt. And I remember walking out of there and just like looking at the credits and being like, what a dream job that would be, you know? And like, (laughs) I think literally at the time I had just started getting produced as a playwright. So I think my first plays were happening in like these tiny, tiny theaters. And so um, it was just like laughable, this idea that I would write for Pixar someday, like looking at where I was then and what Pixar represented. So 
Yeah, I think there was always that sense of like, what a what heart, you know, like I I'm, I walk out of there, not just exhilarated, but also moved. Um, and then I think that just played out some of my other favorite Pixar movies, like the beginning of Up, which just destroyed me. Oh. I mean, just weeping <laughs> in a theater. Right. And um, and then that moment in Ratatouille, which uh, with the critic and, you know, that beautiful monologue the critic has, uh, which was, I think, particularly resonant being uh, a theater person uh, who, you know, we are so at the mercy of our critics. So, yeah, there were definitely like these special Pixar moments um, that when I finally did start working there really um, kind of inspired me, but also haunted me. <laughs> it was like, there's the bar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Just, God. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I can't. I can't possibly. So there was a lot of awe. I think when I first started working there. Yeah. Well, hopefully there's going to be, you know, a, a potential couple sitting down on the sofa as, as a date to watch Green <laughs> Red. And this whole thing comes full circle for you. Um, but w one thing that's been really fun about kind of researching for this conversation is the multiplicity of ways that the cast of this film have all kind of interpreted the Red Panda and what it stands for <laughs> from like intergenerational trauma to the pressure to be perfect that mm. many kind of uh, children of Im immigrant parents kind of often feel on their shoulders. So um, we'll start with that question. Like, what does the Red Panda represent to you, Julia? For me, the Red Panda has always been kind of a deeper metaphor, not just for puberty and those changes, but just for all the sides of ourselves that we put away or are ashamed of. Um, the parts of ourselves are just a bit more wild and just maybe like not the parts of us that the people we love really want to, to see and spend time with. Um, and I think that for me, that just resonated because I grew up just, I don't know why, maybe it's just my, um, I don't know if it's my nature or nurture, but I just remember intensely wanting to please people so much when I was younger. Um, so I think the idea that the panda is this unruly, <laughs> <laughs> refuses to be pleasant, um, aspect of ourselves just really resonates and goes, um, and, and I think, you know, it, for me, it's just an added dimension to it. You know, it works so well, literally as a metaphor for puberty and adolescence, but I think for, uh, the adults watching, hopefully it's not about just this one finite moment in someone's life, because I feel like we're constantly evolving and constantly changing and constantly seeing new parts of ourselves that we're trying to integrate into ourselves. So for me, that metaphor is a bit broader because I think it's hopefully applicable to people at other stages in their life too, whenever you're crossing a threshold into a new phase. And what do you know about the kind of evolution of that metaphor? Like, it sounds like it might have been in place, you know, prior to your involvement mm -hmm. and maybe from the very beginning, perhaps it was the actual seed of the project. But yeah, so was it a case of like um, that metaphor being in place and the film kind of blossoming around it? Or did it kind of take some refining to the best of your knowledge? I think it's both. I think it was both because um, I do remember early on, like I would look at the early artwork for Turning Red and I just loved it because there was, again, that irreverence. And there was like this funny drawing that Adobe did where like May is like praying to the gods, but she's praying. It's like, you know, let me do well in school. Let me, let me fill up a B cup. <laughs> you know, like, It was so funny, you know, and it was that spirit of just um, a girl who just wants to be grown up, you know what I mean? And who wants to be a woman. Um, and so I think, uh, that concept was there pretty early on. Um, but then I think when I came in, in terms of developing it, we actually went away from it for a while because it was almost like that's there for us, you know, the metaphor of like, she's smelly, she's hairy. And so there were, there were, I think a couple of drafts that really steered a lot more towards her just wanting to be independent or her wanting to have some freedom, her wanting to be able to just hang out with her friends if she wanted to. Um, and I think that was all really necessary exploration because then it it was something that we could really embrace and explore, like what growing up meant to May. And then we could come back to that through line of, you know, just the literal change in her in her life and body. Uh, and then hopefully then kind of combine both so that it was a more resonant uh, depiction in the end, but by exploring fully both aspects of it. And were there kind of movie touch points for you guys? Like, Incredible Hulk is one that came to mind for me, but like, <laughs> what were some of the, yeah, like Jekyll and Hyde, what, what were some of the touchstones for you guys? You know, I think that, gosh, when I think about the early touch points, we, we would talk about sometimes anime movies that were influential um, in terms of the feel and the, some, some of the quietness of the movie. 
but there really wasn't a huge one that was our emotional anchor. Maybe there were a couple that helped us in terms of like, okay, how did those movies deal with the big transformation? Like Teen Wolf, for instance, right? Yes. Like, you know, so, which we were like, how did so they good. do it? You know? Um, so, so there were like movies that helped us think about the plot and the structure, but I have to say, because we were in kind of uncharted territory, there really wasn't a movie that had explored a lot of this stuff in exactly the way we wanted to. So in kind of a, a great way, there wasn't already a touchstone for this kind of thing. All we had were versions that were sort of similar, but it didn't feel like there was anything that was exactly what we wanted to do which I think then is also one of the great things, right? That there wasn't anything already there. So we had kind of this untrammeled, you know, freshly fallen snow <laughs> that no one had stepped into. It was like, there it is for the taking, you know? And um, I think we just sort of went forth, you know, uh, kind of afraid, <laughs> but also, you know, kind of excited. <laughs> And can you unpack that for me? Like uncharted waters, like clearly this film kind of broaches uh, yeah. subject matter and kind of delves into things like female puberty that, well, it's not even just a case of they're not often discussed in kids films. It's not even a case of they're not often discussed in films, just generally in the culture. Like that is a topic that goes under discussed. Like, so when you, when you talk about uncharted waters and being conscious that you were doing something new here, what kind of things were you aware that was, was new about Turning Red? I felt that we weren't necessarily feeling like, oh, this is new and, and uh, different. It was more just that I think we all, and, and when I say all, it's not just me and Domi, but also even the producer, the technical director, the women involved, um, the men who, who have daughters and wives who are involved, that there was a sense that... Um, not only have we not seen some of this stuff talked about in our pop culture, but we don't actually talk about it in our lives. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I didn't grow up yeah. having comfortable conversations about periods and, and puberty. Um, and so I think there was a sense of like, oh, we, we are all well acquainted with this genre of coming of age. We are all well acquainted with these stories, but this dimension of those stories seems to have been completely invisible. So I think for us, it wasn't consciously going, that's never been talked about. Let's talk about that. It was more just when we talked about, well, if we're going to depict puberty and girlhood and development, that it just felt like, well, then this is all part of that. And so it just felt natural to do it. And it was maybe only as a side thought as we were doing it, that it was like, huh, this is funny how this has never been talked about before or done before you know like one of my great joys I think was writing that scene where um you know May turns into a panda for the first time and I just love the pyramid of menstrual products you know <laughs> that was just yes. the joy of being able to put that on screen and having a line being like what do you need you know liners you know pads maxi did it like and just going through it. and how every <laughs> single woman knows that pyramid of like all the various types of products you need um, and so the joy of, of working on projects like this is when you can like articulate something and feel like I've never, <laughs> why that's such a human natural part of everyday experience, but it's never been up there. And so when you find something like that, you're just like, yes, I got to it first. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like such a joy. So, um, so I think once we started feeling those moments of being like, this is so fun because we haven't seen it before, then, then I think there was more sense of like, let's do as many of that as, you know, many of those things as we can, because it's, it's, it's such a fun thing. And it, and it, and it's so obvious. And yet it felt like it wasn't obvious for so long. No, it's funny from the trailer. I, I think I had clocked that this movie might be about female puberty. You know, <laughs> I, I was like, I'm sure it's no coincidence at all that it's a red panda, but, but the movie doesn't just kind of like hide behind that metaphor. Like, as you say, there are explicit references to, to getting your first period and, Ming asks if, I think the phrase is, has your red peony bloomed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the very delicate way. Yeah. And I think it's generational, frankly, because I think that uh, my generation, sort of child of the 80s, 
like it was definitely something we did not talk about and it was um just something you're ashamed of when it happens and what i've already noticed uh and i think what was really prescient of uh, the turning red team was that we are having daughters who are growing up in a very different moment where now um i have a daughter who's 10 and i can already see in the things she's reading that it's brought up there's so many graphic novels like written by, uh, created by women who talk about growing up. So I feel like actually in the YA world or like the young graphic novel world, all of this stuff is getting really explored. So we're kind of playing catch up to them. I would have to say that maybe they were even, you know, earlier (laughs) than we were um, (laughs) because like I see these um, topics coming up and, and I see it being much more normalized than it was when I was growing up for sure. So we've had the writers of Pixar movies on the show before and, so our listeners know how arduous the process of attaining that Pixar perfection in terms of storytelling can be. Like, so Soul, Inside Out, mm. these, the, the sort of movies that we know and love now, they were hard fought successes that required so many revisions. And there were so many moments in which the story was just not working. And, you know, these writers were kind of banging their head against walls, trying to kind of come up with solutions. Um Talk me through the degree to which that was the case on Turning Red. What were some of the biggest obstacles that you had to find a solution for? Any story beats that weren't particularly working and you had to kind of approach in a new way? It was definitely much, very much in line with the norm of being extremely harrowing and difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel such a kinship with the other Pixar writers because I think we all go through a very similar process and it's not easy for anyone. Um that said, I do feel like this particular movie had a kind of energy to it from the beginning. Uh, it just, it didn't, it didn't not hit obstacles, but it just had such momentum. And I, I, I feel like a lot of that is Domi where it just felt like we were able to keep it going. Like, so it didn't feel like the movie ever completely stopped and got completely lost. But when I think about the, the, challenges one of the main challenges i think was that it has so many disparate elements you know it has a family has friends in the beginning it had even more elements like (laughs) um there was a cousin there was an aunt like there were all these other characters and others um kind of b stories and c stories and the welding together of all of those disparate things i think was just really hard and even now when i look at the movie i just think how almost every moment is is doing three things at once you know cuz the only way to write a movie like this with so many elements is to do it in a way that it's it's just dense it's dense with story it's dense with character um and so i think there was just the 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 sheer technical challenge of how to weld all those elements in a way that felt organic um, was hard. And then I think there were also plot points that were hard. Like what is the ending? Like we didn't know the ending for a long time, which is terrifying. Um, and there was a lot of like sleepless nights, <laughs> you know, of just being like, oh my God, <laughs> it has to have a Pixar ending. What is it? You know? Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, just praying, praying that somehow it would come together or our unconsciouses would be smarter than our consciousnesses <laughs> and like <laughs> consciousnesses, I should say. Um, but yeah, I think those were the challenges and um, this, the streamlining of it, I think was, was probably the biggest challenge. With the exception of the ending, which we'll get to, was the skeleton of the story pretty much already in place? Like, you know, in the finished film, May is this girl with a similar home life to what a lot of immigrant kids talk about. You know, there's that thing about like being torn between wanting to honor the traditional values of your parents while also having a natural gravitation towards pop culture that might feel alien or even immoral to, to your parents. Was that always in the film? And was the mother daughter relationship always the emotional core of the movie? Like, how much was intact of the finished film in these early drafts? Yeah, I would say that from the beginning, there were those elements of a strong mother-daughter relationship and of the red panda, right? The girl turns to the red panda. But there were certain things that just were a little bit off that I think ended up getting modulated in ways that really uh, kind of made it more the movie it is now. Uh, one of those things I would say is that there is a classic story, I think, of a girl or a person being torn between two worlds. And early on, there was more of a sense that May was rebellious from the start, like deliberately hiding herself from her mom. 
And I think one of the things we discovered was what actually makes this relationship different is that May loves being her mom's daughter. And it's kind of a <laughs> funny um, modulation, but a really crucial yeah. one, because if she's already rebellious from the top, then nothing that happens after that is really growth for her. Do you know what I mean? Because she already knows she wants to be more uh, assimilated or more Western and her mom is holding her back. So I think for us, one of the discoveries was realizing that May at the top loves her mom, loves that closeness um, and is actually doesn't actually know she has a problem, right? That she's actually fully <laughs> like, I rock it at school. I rock it at home. All good. You know, so then when the panda comes, it doesn't cause her mom a problem. It causes her a problem, right? Like that's her problem that she has. So then that just became a very different uh, thing in a good way. Um, and then the other thing I would say that we had that modulated a lot was what her wants and goals were, because it wasn't the case that she knew she wanted to get to a concert with her friends. Um, she very much, uh, I think in an early draft, she wanted to go to boarding school. So this is more the version of she knows her mom is cramping her style and she wants to get away. Um, but then it was just hard to imagine in a whole audience of people being on board and really rooting for her to go to boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then yeah. I think it was about also finding, oh, it's about being with her friends. It's about the concert. So there were a lot of elements, I would just say that all changed, you know, so that we had those core relationships, but um, the elements of the story definitely evolved a lot over time. So was there like an epiphanous moment where you guys stumbled upon the idea of four glittery delinquents with gyrations for the boy band? <laughs> I would say I long, by the way, I just want to be a glittery delinquent. Who would it? Who would it? Indeed. Yeah. Um, no, I think that element of the of May and her friends being into four town and four townies was always there because I think that was always a part of like what do you know? What would these girls be into? Of course, the boy band. But I don't remember when they became such a central part of her desire. I I do remember there was a sense at some point that like she and her friends are up to something. What are they up to? Right. That is taking her away from the temple and her mom. And so we had a whole version, which I loved, which was the girls got obsessed with making a music video because the idea was that 4chan was having a fan video, uh, music video contest, right? And that if you won the video contest, you would get to see them in person. So we had this whole thing where May and her friends made this awesome music video, got storyboarded, everything. It was so, so, so funny. And it was all in service to them to win this contest and go see the concert. And then I think at some point, like, I feel like telling stories continually, like you're drawing out these long connections. And then eventually you look at this piece of string you have and you just go, what if we just brought the two ends together? <laughs> you know, you literally, it was like, oh, instead of them like making a music video to get to see their band, why aren't they just trying to see their band, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, and so yeah. a lot of this became like, like almost like cut and connect, you know, like bring those two elements closer together. So we lost it, in, but it, it helped the story be a lot more direct and a lot more streamlined. So um, yeah, there was this sense that that was kind of an aha moment. Like they are the goal. They're, they're not doing something to get to them. They're just trying to get to them. Uh, and then I think once that happened, then we could really more clearly see the end, end game of it. You know, like what is what May wants being on a collision course with what her mom wants. And in terms of that boy band as well, like it, it really does give the movie like a ticking clock. Like it may needs to get this ritual done and sort of figure out this situation or so it seems in the first act by the time of this concert. And it, it, I guess it gives, it gives the screenplay like a certain impetus, a certain urgency. Um, there's also a kind of one thing we should mention at this point as well is the setting of this movie, the backdrop of this movie it's not present day. It's kind of, by my gauge, like early noughties by, you know, cha-cha yes. slide, flip phones, <laughs> Tamagotchis. Um, can you tell me about how you landed on that? Was it, was it just a kind of a case of like, that was a more fun texture to have as a backdrop than setting it in modern day? Were there particular story beats that you didn't think would work as well in modern day, either because of the technology or whatever? Or, or was it just a case of like, that was a period in which some people involved in the film kind of, you know, they had gone through the experiences that May was kind of going through at that time. Mm -hmm. So it felt appropriate to set it in, in the early noughties. I would say it's probably the latter. It, it kind of was more of a literal decision. Uh, I, I think just because Domi was that age in early 2000s. And so it was just a, a way, I think, to really tap into her psyche and her experience. 
Um, I will say, though, that over time, the wisdom of that decision or early uh, choice just paid dividends because I think it helped us all tap into our nostalgia, helped us all kind of tap into a meta version of that time, because I think it was all about going back to a more innocent time um, and a less seemingly complicated time. And definitely there was a lot happening in 2002, but I think that as time went on, we started dealing with so much in the present day that to have tried to do a film in the present day would have been unimaginable, (laughs) you know, and just giving it like almost a safe space of exploration in the past really helped. Um, And I also think that it was to me a, just a really smart decision because there are so many decisions that have to be made on aesthetics, on the world. And to be able to peg that to your own personal, like, okay, I remember what I did when I was that age, what music I listened to, my Tamagotchi or this or that. I think it just helped um, make the whole world seem really vivid and grounded in detail and specificity. So I think for all of those reasons, it it never strayed from being in the early 2000s. It was always um, just one of the touchstones or, you know, pillars of the movie. If Tamagotchis make a comeback after this movie, you've got to get you've got to get a percentage on that, Julia. Yes, apparently there's a Tamagotchi app now, so that you don't even have to have a real Tamagotchi. You can have like a virtual Tamagotchi <laughs> that you take care of. So uh, I think that to me encapsulates the whole movie. It's like very meta. It's like 2002, but shot through our modern lens. <laughs> yeah, the Tamagotchi Renaissance begins. Yes. Um, soundtracks by Cha Cha Slide. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So um, in terms of kind of like, you know, in those early scenes, we establish that backdrop, we establish May and her kind of effervescent personality, her friendships with, with, you know, her classmates and her relationship with Ming. We then get to the inciting incident, which, of course, is like, you know, the sort of emergence of this enormous red panda kind of erupting within. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you tell me about sort of like the back and forth that happened you kind of like worked out the best way to kind of introduce that element and you know there's a lot of mythology that we're kind of uh privy to as the kind of film goes on in terms mm-hmm. of like the idea of sun yi um mm-hmm. it's also kind of a generational thing ming explains she went through the same thing like yeah. in terms of actually kind of executing that idea of this red panda like how tricky was it how many iterations were were there of, of that initial kind of introduction to the red panda It was a little tricky. I mean, early on, I think it was tricky just to establish what the rules of that kind of transformation are. Um, As you were sort of pointing out, it was inspired in part, I think, by a lot of the transformation narratives you'll see in anime, where like there are characters who often turn into fantastical beings, but that's not really a trope in American (laughs) or Western cinema. So we had, we did look at those things like, um, you know, what are the big transformation movies? Like we looked at Teen Wolf or Big, (laughs) you know, even (laughs) even Splash, right? Like a long time ago, a little bit. Yeah. Like these ideas that you have these um, transformations, but then we needed to know what the rules of those were, right? So early on, I remember there was a version where um, when May transformed to the panda, we were like, what happens to her clothes? Like <laughs> we had to think about like, what's the, what, where did her glasses go? <laughs> like, why does not the panda, you know? And so we had to really think about, oh, like the panda's kind of like this overlay on top of her, you know, so that um, like an early version was more a credible Hulk-ish where I think when May post- like when May foomped into a panda and then went back into a girl, she was like in her underwear or something like this idea that like the clothes would just rip off her when the panda happened. Um, and then of course for a variety of reasons that, you know, obviously couldn't, couldn't stay. So yeah, we had to think about a magical way to, to deal with the transformation and keep it consistent throughout. And I, I think a lot of the trickiness of the panda was just the consistency of it. Like how emotional does she have to get? Like what's the trigger threshold that the panda comes and then um, how do we establish that towards the back end of the movie, she's getting uh, still big emotions, but no longer maybe panning at the drop of a hat. Um, we would often do screenings too, where it would be weird because there wouldn't be enough panda. We'd be like, oh, she's a girl too long, you know, but what's the right ratio? What's the right proportion of panda to girl? You know, <laughs> like all these things are just like, oh, like if she's not a panda in the movie, we miss it. So it was almost like we can't have too many scenes where she's just a girl because it doesn't feel like the movie anymore. So there were all these like concerns about the panda that uh, I didn't anticipate that were 
just things we had to keep track of and follow. Um, and then when her mom also became a band, it was <laughs> even more double because there were early versions of the movie where her mom was never a panda. Like that was not a family trait. It was only May. Um, and so initially it was a bit more inexplicable that May became a panda. And we tried to get away with not explaining it. And we couldn't, <laughs> our feet were held to the fire. It's like, no, no, no why is this happening? And so it was just over time that it became a family trait, which was better. Uh, and then uh, one of the more kind of like final things to be adjusted was that her mom was revealed to also have gone through the same thing. And that was not part of the, the initial conceit. So is this partly why we kind of ended up with the second act that we do that kind of concern of like are we delivering enough panda because i mean i love the second act of this movie is kind of like classic pixar storytelling insofar as like it doesn't just hand you this this sort of film that you think you're in for like i was braced from the first act for this maybe being a story about may having to kind of hide or suppress her red panda away from her classmates and uh yeah. ultimately <laughs> learning a lesson about the joy of release and letting go instead of trying to fit in etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah mm -hmm. but instead you know she opens up to her friends and the people in her school and you know we have these characters that are almost signposted as mean girls and even they kind of love and embrace the panda straight away and we get this second act in which we get a lot of the panda and we get to see the comic possibilities of you know this this panda you know I, I believe the phrase you used was fumping into a yeah, panda fumping. yeah that's I the official it. phrase got, yes, got it yes for booming um, yeah there's a lot of <laughs> onomatopoeic words for fumping um yeah. that's a really astute observation i think because there were early versions too where um may <laughs> i think one of the early versions was that may as a big panda was hiding from her friends at school um, they didn't understand it, but also it was the idea was that her mom was kind of actually into it because she could monetize it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's an early version where May was the panda May, I should say, was at the temple and her mom was like using her to like um, make more money to save the temple. Like that was also, I think, an early version where the temple was in trouble financially. Yeah. So there was this whole um, thing where the locus of the panda was at the temple. But what we kind of found was that it's not nearly as fun because what you want to see is a fish out of water, not a fish in water. You know what I mean? And so to see the panda at the temple being embraced by the temple goers who were like, oh, it's the mystical red panda. It was interesting, but it just felt like it's not really popping the way it should. And then I think we realized, oh, we need to take the panda out of the temple. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's the fun of it. It's not fun to see a mystical creature in a mystical setting you want to see the panda with like a little backpack you know kind of going to school like <laughs> so I think then the second act did sort of take a swerve into oh that we have to actually go against expectation which is that the people who you wouldn't think embrace it do embrace it and then vice versa that the mom is the one who's actually like let's get rid of this let's shut this down and I think the reason why that works uh, hopefully works is that you know, even if the girls are coded as mean girls, even if the kids um, are just supposed to be normal kids, what I think we have discovered just culturally is that everyone loves, everyone loves authenticity. Everyone responds to authenticity. Like all of these um, YouTube videos, the ones that get millions and billions of likes, it's because there's some sense that we're seeing the real. And um, I do find this younger generation of kids and millennials and teens and Gen Zers, all of them are just so much more, uh, their, their, their BS meters are so <laughs> like, <laughs> finely tuned and they respond to the real. So I think it's not so much the kids loving the panda, but hopefully the sense that they are responding to like May being truly, truly herself and authentic. And so I think celebrating that uh, actually kind of works because we as a culture are celebrating that. During this whole portion of the movie, kind of I'm sort of, expecting kind of Tyler to emerge as, as the antagonist or for the introduction of an antagonist. But I'm not sure that there is one or, or not. There's not a character, certainly, who seems to be the antagonist. Um, mm -hmm. It's certainly not Ming. I don't think it's Tyler. So, Julia, like, who did you or rather what did you kind of consider being the antagonist of this movie, if there is one? I would say in some ways, May is her own worst enemy, potentially. You know, that that what she is in danger of doing is internalizing the wrong messages and that by internalizing the wrong messages, she might 
make a decision early on that would lead her just to be a less uh, a less full version of, of herself. Um, but I do think you're right. There's no real antagonist because early on it was clear that May, May's biggest obstacle was her mom and all the things her mom embodies. But you can't really make a villain out of somebody's parent, you know, <laughs> because at the end of the day, she loves May, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that in some ways what became the villain or the antagonist was just the cultural expectations as assumptions that not just May, but her mom were, was saddled with as well. And this idea that they're both kind of unknowingly fighting something bigger than themselves and not even realizing it, you know, but that I think what the movie hopefully shows is that May, because she's growing up in a different world, has the friends she has actually wakes up in a way that her mom couldn't, you know? So I think um, it's pointing towards a more hopeful present um, and a future. But yeah, I do think that when I think what May's enemy is, I, I think it's kind of herself you know, that she might quash herself. Uh, and so in a way, hopefully by the end, you're rooting for her to, to not do that, you know, and to, and to fight her, her own uh, kind of tendency to please others before pleasing herself. Which is why it feels like such a victory in that sort of uh, ritual scene. May is supposed to be essentially exercised of the red panda but she can't go through with it she's learned to love and own that part of herself we, we're getting towards the ending now and you mentioned some dark nights of the soul kind of approaching this ending trying to figure out what it should be it's inherently a it's quite a low stakes story and i should caveat i should caveat that by saying when i was a teenager you know going to a concert seemed incredibly life or death but in the grand scheme of things you know may is not saving the world or averting some major crisis you had to kind of deliver on this sort of pixar ending as you've called it there had to be a certain spectacle a certain kind of climax to this kind of inherently slightly more low stakes kind of story talk me through kind of the genesis of this ending and just how kind of uh harrowing to use your word it was finding a conclusion yeah i i think that I mean, the horror of the of the challenge was knowing that whatever the ending, it had to deliver emotionally and that the only way to deliver emotionally was to articulate or portray something that felt truthful, but new. Right. So there's a sense of like, what is the thing that hasn't been said already <laughs> about mother daughter relationships, you know, racking my brain Um and the thing is, like, so that was happening on the emotional side, right? Just knowing there needs to be some sort of emotional catharsis. And then on the plot side and the story side was, like, I was never worried about delivering on spectacle because as soon as we looked at what a boy band concert is actually like, there was no doubt <laughs> that it would be huge. You know, like, yeah, yeah. maybe even, like, too big, just exploding off the screen because um, those <laughs> concerts are just by nature completely overwhelming. Um, and emotionally, I think the screams are ear splitting, the, the hearts are exploding. It's just, we all knew that that would be super extra. But I think what gave the ending its um, meaning is not that May's finally getting to the thing she always wanted, um, but it's that she sort of is almost at it, right? There's, that, there's a, a great moment where she seems to almost like be living out her fantasy her and her dreams with her friends, getting all the things she says she's wanted and, and it's interrupted, <laughs> right? It's snatched from her just on the cusp of realizing uh, it all. And so then I think that we all just knew that what we have set up is this mother daughter who are so tight in the beginning and knowing that they had to get as opposite of that by the end, right? That sort of classic movie structure of like, you can't just do a journey this big, you have to make the journey as big as possible. And so we all knew it was headed towards some kind of showdown <laughs> and reckoning, you know? Um, and that's the promise I think of act one, where you see them in sync, literally in sync, doing things, <laughs> you know, choreographed practically so tight, so loving. And then knowing that as tight and loving as they are in the beginning, that the sky dome moment is uh, the opposite of that, you know, and just what was startling to me was how easy it was for all of us to remember 
some kind of rage filled, you know, confrontation with our parents, you know, and, and so it kind of was in line then with, I think, what feels true to us that these people who we love the most can also completely unhinge us, right? And I think that goes both ways for mothers as well as daughters. That, uh, so I think there was just so much to tap into emotionally with that kind of fight. And I think, like you said, in a weird way, it is low stakes in the sense that your mother's never going to stop loving you. A daughter's never going to stop loving her mom. There's no chance that Ming is going to say, you're not my daughter and we never speak again, right? So that, in that sense, yes, there's no stakes. But the stakes of it are, is like, are you going to have a real parent and child relationship? Or are you going to be strangers to each other? Like, what kind of relationship are you going to have? And I think um, those stakes to me seem super high because I think we all have tricky, complicated relationships with the people who, who love us and bore us, you know? And so this idea is that like, what's at stake is, are they going to have a real relationship or are they going to have a fake one? You know, are they going to have like one of those distant, estranged, you know, um, I don't know. I just feel like it just taps into all of us thinking about our own relationships too. So that kind of became it, you know, like, are you going to be honest? Are you going to just keep hiding from each other? Um, and then to me, that whole moment had the added dimension of what we see in the beginning is a May whose life is compartmentalized, right? There's school, there's home, everything is like neatly in its place. And then in that moment, by the end, everything breaks down. The boundaries between all of her worlds, it's just obliterated. And it's the, it's the um, to me, the trial by fire she has to pass through when everything comes crashing down. So that last moment, I think quite deliberately became a moment where everyone is integrated in this, not even integrated, but everyone's like kind of colliding in this moment. So it's not just the band and her mom, but her friends, her family, like all of it is swirling within the sky dome. And um, that sort of became this like apex moment uh, of the movie. You know, in the beginning of the film, as you say, you know, she has to compartmentalize and almost like code switch between these different lives. But by the end of the movie, She's gone through this process of self-acceptance and her mum has gone through a process of accepting her daughter where well, she no longer needs to do that, that code switching. And it seems like all those elements of her personality and her life can just just be all out there. And uh, that's just such a nice note to lead the movie on. Yeah, and I think deliberately so. That sense that by the end, I always love it when her friends enter the temple and are hanging out there with her because it's like a sense that everyone's welcome in each other's spaces finally, that there's just one space now, you know? Um, and I think that is something I feel like I'm still trying to do. You know? So <laughs> I think that's what, you know, movies can promise us like happy endings that we ourselves are still hoping for, for ourselves. You've said previously, Julia, that, that the question, what if, is particularly important in your approach to story, that when things happen a certain way, you wonder, what if, what if something else had happened? And, and from there, your kind of imagination leads you to places of great fear and great hope. Did that factor in here? Was that sort of, kind of a tool you were able to use on this movie? And, yeah. and what's so valuable and fruitful about that as a storytelling tool? It's a crucial tool, I think, to be able to approach almost every story point and ask yourself, what, what would happen if we did the opposite of that? I would say that it is only that tool that led us to so many of the moments we have because we started off with a story that was di diametrically the opposite of what we ended up with. You know, so even with something like talking about how Ming was monetizing her daughter to save the temple <laughs> and kind of into the panda, like, you know, uh, kind of like fluffing it up and making it look presentable. But then it was crucial that we could look at that and be like, well, what if she didn't? What if she hid the panda and did the exact opposite of all those things? What does that open up for us? And what would that mean? And you can often find that by flipping something and just looking at it in a different way that you realize, oh, it opens up all these other possibilities, which we didn't have in the first iteration. And then we can explore those and see how those work. So yeah, I do feel like it's really crucial when you're working on a story to not actually get so um, tethered to things that you can't imagine moving them or reversing them. Because what I always would say to Domi, it's like, we can always go back. Like it's always there for us. There's nothing to lose by looking at it in a different way or trying the opposite of what we did before. Because 
you know, it's always going to be written in that form and we can always go back. Um, and so, and nine times out of 10, we wouldn't go back nine times out of 10, we would flip it and be like, Oh, this is better. And then we would just continue plowing ahead. Before we go, I'd like to, well, hopefully not put you too on the spot with this question. It's a bit of a profound one, but I'm kind of curious, like what change you would like this film to create in the world? Like the, the way that inside out, for example, gave kids a template to acknowledge and talk about their feelings is there a toolkit for something that you hope Turning Red kind of might hand to kids experiencing some of the same things that May is going through? Wow. It's a, it's a hard question only because I didn't let myself think about it for so long. You know, I think when you're working on a story in a, in a project like this, you do kind of just try not to think too hard about how it will be in the world because it's like putting the cart before the horse. Um, at this point, I think... It means a lot to me that it's a story where we get to see uh, a character of Asian descent in a new way that just has become increasingly meaningful, I think, over the last few years. And just as I get older and have kids of my own, I, I love the fact that they're growing up in a world where movies like this exist, because it's not the world I grew up in. And I, I just the fact of that is kind of, you know, a lot to just a lot to be proud of that I got to be part of that. But in terms of the change, I just want, gosh, I would just love to increase the quotient of joy in the world just by a tiny bit. <laughs> you know, like if there's just like another speck of joy to put on the pile of, you know, just because it has been such a hard time. And I do love that it is approaching all these kind of normal yet traumatizing experiences <laughs> that casting them in a joyful way. And I just think that if in the future people watching it who would normally not have felt seen and understood do feel a bit more seen and understood, I think that would just be an incredible thing to be part of. That's so beautifully put and a wonderful place to draw this conversation to a close, Julia. <laughs> Before I let you go, though, is there anything you have coming up that you can tell listeners about? Yeah, I mean, one of the the projects I have going now is that I've um, I'm on the second season of Paper Girls, uh, which is a Amazon series. It actually hasn't even aired its first season yet, but it's a great another sort of great coming of age story. And my joke is that with Red, I had four 13 year old girls, and with Paper Girls, I have a story about four 12 year old girls. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just one of the writers, not the writer. And it's a, it's based on a graphic novel by Brian K. Vaughn. So there's still yeah, some yeah. kind of art links to it. And it's, <laughs> it's just fun. It's science fiction. It's coming of age again. Um, it just, it's like an endlessly interesting uh, realm to work in. So yeah, so that, that's what I'm working on now. And hopefully that will be out in the world someday uh, soon ish. And so, um, yeah, so that's what's going on now. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to go download the Tamagotchi app and maybe <laughs> listen to Cha Cha Slide as well. Um, but this has been so much fun. Thank you so much, Julia, for coming oh, on Script Apart. Thank you so much. It's been great. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>